Welcome to Winslow Christian Fellowship. My name is Colin Points and uh, I'm the pastor. <coughs> Welcome to our morning service. We are small in number. But does God see a minuscule congregation and think, well, they don't matter? Christ came and died for each and every one of us. And so where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there with us. So uh, I despise the day of small things. Um, I'm going to read uh, Psalm 123, which uh, should be up on the screen. I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. As the eyes of slaves, slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt. We have endured much ridicule from the proud, much contempt from the arrogant. I mean, I wonder sometimes if uh, the world doesn't look at us with contempt so much as just dismissal. Mm -hmm. uh, we can look at ourselves with contempt, probably. But do not despise the day of small things. We are here. We're meeting with God. Mm. We're praising God. We're going to hear him speak. So let's uh, speak to him now in prayer. Let's ask him to very much be with us. Lord God in heaven, we do thank you and we praise you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you that you are great. We are not good, we are not great. We are very insignificant and we're, we, we've done nothing to deserve your attention. And yet, Lord, we trust that because of what your son has done for us in coming and dying on the cross, he has opened the way for us to come to you, the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and to be welcomed into your presence. And you have come, that you can be with us when we meet together, when we gather in your name. Though we are few in number, I thank you that the that, that is not to you, and it matters, it shouldn't matter to us, ultimately. And so, Lord, as we praise your name and pray that our praises will be from the heart, and I ask that that might be a joyful sound of praise that is pleasing to you, and we ask that as you speak, that you would give us ears to hear, and Lord, that you might do that work in us that is slowly transforming us, be more like your son. Lord, that is a miraculous work that can happen this morning. And so, Lord, we thank you for that and pray that we will recognise just the significance, the importance and the, the specialness of today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let's uh, stand and let's stand and sing. First two songs here I am to worship and then shout to the Lord on the earth. Let's sing. Let's stand.
Well, for a warm welcome again to our service. Um, a few notices to highlight. Is, uh, we've got our prayer meeting every morning on Zoom at 8.45. You know that what happens is that Mike's going to have to blur your face out again. <laughs> takes time to do that. Um, prayer meeting at 8.45 each morning on Zoom. Do join us if you can. Um, Next week we have our all-age service, um, it's the coronation weekend, so uh, I think I'm trying, I haven't thought of what, but I'm sure we're going to make it special because it's the coronation weekend. Yeah. And then um, the week after that, the 14th of May, is the next big Sunday, so we're uh, going to be having lunch together and then studying together. And we've looked at the Trinity, and so now we're going to more detail about the Trinity. And we're going to look at the fatherhood of God. So um, that's, uh, and what we're going to do is actually, we thought we could make this, the big Sunday, a bit more pacey. Uh, I think three, finishing at three o'clock for some people is proving to be a bit too much of Sunday. So. We're going to have our normal service in the morning and then we'll, we'll go to, we'll have our lunch starting at 12.15, so we'll be a bit more prompt about sitting down to eat. So 12.15 to 1.15 we'll eat lunch and then 1.15 we'll start the study and we thought the singing, well we've done singing in the first part of the service, we won't, we won't have to sing um, in the group and then we'll just go straight to the study, finish at 2 o'clock, so instead of finishing at 3 o'clock we'll be finishing at 2 o'clock. And nobody's listening to a word I'm saying. Yes, we oh, are. <laughs> you said no. you're finishing at two o'clock. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Well, well done for paying attention. A bit of distraction. So it's a two o'clock finish instead of a three o'clock finish. So I hope that's helpful. And uh, I think, you know, we're, we're still at the same amount of time studying um, the, the subject of the fatherhood of God, looking at the first person of the Trinity. Are you dancing out? Oh, sorry about that. There we go. We're learning how to manage. I'm not managing. It's going into the crash now, probably it's all right. Um, so that's on the 14th of May, two weeks from now. There is a sign up sheet. We've put the sign up sheet there. On the, um, on the coffee table. So when you go and get your coffee, then uh, <coughs> do put down what you're gonna bring along. Um, and uh, then the next big life group, that's gonna be the 30th of May. So the, the, the big Sundays from going forward, we're looking at the second Sunday of each month being the big life group, and then, the, sorry, the big Sunday, and then the big life group being towards the end of the month. So, uh, I think that's all I need to say in terms of. <coughs> I could have just stood here holding him the whole time, couldn't I? And that would have <laughs> worn me out. Um, now, I should put on that picture. I wonder what you think of this, the headline. We saw this to, just oh, today. Um, so, this is for next week. We've got the, uh, the coronation coming. The uh, public are going to be asked to swear allegiance to King Charles. What do we think? Is that, is that right? Should we be swearing allegiance to a king who is not Jesus? Any ideas on that? thought to myself, let's look up the word allegiance. Let's just get a better understanding of what allegiance actually means. Uh, loyalty and obedience. Owed to one's country or government. Devotion or loyalty to a person, group or cause. So allegiance doesn't have to be to your king and government, but it can be to a cause, to a group, to a person. But uh, loyalty, obedience, devotion, those are the kinds of words. Right. And uh, has anybody seen this? The, yeah. Has anybody seen the wording of it? Yeah. What do you think? 
so this is the article saying this is what and this is a new thing. They didn't do this previous. Uh, previously, when um, a monarch is cor has their, their crown, their coronation, the um, the peers, the, the there was the homage of the peers where they swear allegiance. So it's only the peers, like the um, I guess the House of Lords, isn't it? But um, the order of service will read, all who so desire in the Abbey and elsewhere, that is TV people, watching on TV, say together, I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. <coughs> Isn't there a scripture that says you're not to swear by anything on earth or heaven? Not to swear by anything on earth or heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. dear. I think you're right. So what should we do? Can we make a promise? Make a promise or a pledge. Make a promise. Yeah. Make a pledge, sorry? We have to be a point in it. A point? It's history, presumably, when you were swearing allegiance to go with them in the battle. Yeah, yeah, well... It doesn't well, really make any sense to swear allegiance in that sense to me. It's a bit pointless. Yeah. It's just a bit of um, pageantry and yeah. empty fluff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does anybody else think? So there's, we've got issues with swearing, as in not, not swearing, swearing, but you know, don't swear by anything in heaven or earth. It's sort of like promising, though, isn't promise, it? Why yeah. would you get by anything you promise? Yeah, you make a vow. That's not it's, it's, it's a level of promise, isn't there? When you make a promise, you make a promise. But then there's a vow, or there's, I swear, it's a kind of, there's a depth, there's a sort of... Mm. So let's say that, yes, the concept of promising. So I promise obedience, I, uh, I swear, I pay true allegiance to your majesty, so there's obedience, yeah. loyalty, uh, and to your heirs and successors, according to law. That kind of regulates it quite a significant amount, seeing as what's the king ever going to ask me to do? Which is the point that you're making, really. He's not going to lead me into battle, is he? Mm. So help me God. So it brings God into it, which means That's good. Wow. it's limited. It's limited by the law of the land. It's limited by the fact that if we're saying so help me God, that's kind of assuming that we're never going to put the king above God. So what do we do next Saturday? Do we say, say the words or do we not? Well, the answer is, it's between you and God. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Does it say anywhere in the Bible where we have to um, swear allegiance to other than God? Do we pray for all our leaders? Yeah. We certainly pray for our leaders, yeah. and I think you know what, what we could do is if you if you've got a problem saying these words, you could, when everybody else is saying, say I promise to pray for the king, yeah. and, for the, and for his government, yeah. and that's uh, that's the allegiance it will get from me. You know that's the kind of uh, thing, and that actually means something, then, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Is it is it just a bit of? Uh, Let's try and involve people. Let's make it a bit more uh, interactive, <laughs> an interactive coronation service. Um, anyway, there, there you go. There's something to think about, isn't there? Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray now for the king and uh, pray for ourselves as well. As, his subjects, I guess. Father God in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the life of Queen Elizabeth who we uh, were able to celebrate quite recently and then as we mourned her loss, we were able to rejoice knowing that she, she genuinely looked to you and uh, trusted in you. And, um, so we do thank you for her faith and Lord, we do pray for King Charles now, whose faith seems less clear, but uh, we ask that, Lord, that you will save him um, as we sing in the National Anthem. We pray for your hand to be upon him 
And uh, just as he is passionate about many, many issues, many good issues, then we pray that he might be passionate about having faith in you and encouraging others to have faith and to look to you. Lord God, help us to be loyal in the right way towards him, by which we mean praying for him and for the government, that uh, they may do a good job of leading this nation, of uh, protecting the people of this nation, um, including, Lord, uh, allowing, protecting the freedom to bring the gospel message to whoever would hear it. Uh, Lord God, we would love to see, as a nation, uh, a reformation, a, a revival, a rejuvenation at a spiritual level of people turning to you. And we could see that that potentially could happen at a, at, in a top-down way, that so often it happens that when leaders turn to you, that the people follow their example. And so we do pray for the king and the government in that regard, that the gospel, that you may have a hold upon their lives, that you may lift their eyes to you, and that they may lead by example, and that others may follow by looking to you in faith and obedience. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're, we're not going to have an energy zone, it would seem. So, uh, but we're going to stand and we're going to sing now. And we're going to sing, I'm going to trust in God. We're going to trust in God. Pray now, and uh, I think it'd be good to have a time of open prayer, just an opportunity for us all to uh, come to God um, and to uh, lift up to Him the uh, things that are important. And, uh, so, we can, you know, if you want to carry on praying for the government, for the King, then uh, please do. And um, we can uh, pray for us as a church. 
God can do great things through small gatherings, through small groups of people um, as we seek to serve him and reach out. We are uh, seeking God's guidance. Um, I can carry on praying for Anne. She came home this week uh, and she's doing, I think, really well. She's, um, I think they didn't expect her to be able to go upstairs, but she is sleeping upstairs and uh, making her way up and down the stairs with help, but, uh, I mean, well, with somebody there at least to make sure she gets up the top and down again. So um, she's doing remarkably well, I think. And, uh, uh, Michael um, Peck, is, uh, his ongoing treatment and recovery, he's got one more chemo left. He's, uh, I think, feeling quite worn down by it all. So let's lift him up <coughs> to God. And it's great to see Judy here. Mm. I know you've had a pretty rough week with the pain. So um, let's pray for Julie. Let's um, lift these, uh, these things, these people, and uh, other issues up to God now in prayer. So Lord God in heaven, we do thank you and uh, praise you that Julie can be here with us today and uh, she's had a a week where the pain has at times been excruciating so we do thank you that it's uh, eased off enough that she can be part of our gathering and we pray that you will truly bless her this morning and uh, Lord we do pray for your hand upon her and um, a hand of healing we uh, pray for treatment that she might need that that might come quickly as we know these things just take so long to get through the system and so we pray that Julie might be able to get uh, what she needs sooner rather than later so that she might not be hampered by the, the, the condition that she has. Amen. Lift her up to you Lord and mm -hmm. pray you will bless her in mm -hmm. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lord we give you thanks for answered prayer for Anne and we would just pray that as she settles in back home and um, there will be problems and that we just pray that these might be all possible to be resolved, that she might be able to enjoy being back in her home with her. And particularly we thank you for a day of sunshine where she can enjoy her garden again. Mm. We just pray your blessing and a real strong sense of your presence on hand today. In your name. Michael and pray that uh, yeah. you'll help him to feel more comfortable at home and that uh, the next treatment will go ahead, final treatment as planned, yeah. nothing will come in the way of that and we pray that you will give him strength and uh, <coughs> that you will lighten his spirits too, in Jesus name. And Lord God, we do pray for this church. We thank you for placing Winslow Christian Fellowship here and uh, for blessing us over the years um, and for people who have been blessed who have come through the uh, congregation and gone on to other things. Lord God, we do ask that uh, you might use us in your service, in this place, in the areas around, in the groups of people that we might be meeting in our daily lives, Lord, would you be with us and empower us to be your witnesses, mm. Amen. to share your gospel, to, uh, Lord, have mercy on us and save us from being an irrelevance. It's so easy 
for us to follow the world's opinion of ourselves and think of ourselves as not relevant. But Lord God, we know that you have your hand upon us. We felt that in our individual lives and we know that as a church you are not yet done with the work in, in us and through us and so we look to you and we ask that you will bless us that we might be a blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Well, if you'd like to turn to uh, Mark chapter 13, verses So you mark 13, starting at verse 28. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert, and do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. Well, this is God's word. We'll be thinking about that after we've sung this next song. Beautiful Savior. It's uh, something to sing.
But if you'd like to have that uh, passage, Mark 13, 28 to 37, I'd like to have that open. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father and God in heaven, I, I thank you that you are uh, able to speak, able to guide, able to lead, able to command. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to listen and to respond appropriately, to follow your guidance and your lead, to obey your commands, to trust your word. And I pray that as we read this word now, that you'd help us to understand it. Um, Amen. This chapter of uh, Mark's gospel has got some difficult to understand bits, but there's also some really clear um, commands. And so I pray that you help us to take these things on board, um, not to ignore them, not to forget, not to be complacent. Lord, help us to be challenged about the urgency of the situation in the world that we live in. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, every so often you might see um, sinkholes like this on the news where uh, it's some suburban or urban situation, um, a street or it looks like a back garden there where a sinkhole has just opened up. Um, everybody going about their business, um, nobody aware that there was a cavity opening beneath the ground. What you think of as solid was actually that bit of ground there, that was a, a hollow shell inside. Kind of, and then eventually it gave way and crashed. Um, and uh, how you get those cars out from the driveway now is anybody's guess. Uh, maybe you could drive around, and there might be room to get around it. But uh, it's one of those things where it's, 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 you know, we assume the ground beneath our feet is reliable. Um, how could we walk along the road if we were sort of imagining sinkholes about to open. Mm. Uh, it's not like, I mean, if you go to a, one of those tall buildings that has a glass floor, <coughs> where you look through the glass floor and you can see this huge, this drive, and you go to step on the glass floor and you know in your head it's safe, but you kind of think, I don't know, I can't, I can't do it. Well, it'd be like that, wouldn't it? If we really thought about the possibility of sinkholes, you wouldn't be able to walk a step. The ground in town around here, when you're out and about, you expect roads, the roads, the tarmac roads, the concrete pavements to be solid, permanent, uh, until the day it isn't. And that's where you get you know, pictures of cars that have dropped down holes and uh, great chasms that have been hidden for how long, who knows how long. Uh, and that's all beneath the feet of normal taxpaying people. Who's going to sort this out, eh? How can we cope with such uncertainty in life? Well. The thing is, that is actually what life is like. It is full of uncertainty and a gaping hole could open in front of us, not in a, a literal hole, but a, a, a metaphorical hole could open in our lives at any point. And I'm sure many of you, well, I know many of you can testify to you're living your life and then all of a sudden you lose your job, you lose your health, you lose a loved one. And it could, you know, something out of the blue that you, you just, something you've always thought is just there. I don't even think about it. And it's gone. And you can share testimonies of how life has thrown you these curveballs and it's just been a complete, the bottom falling out of your world kind of situation. But you can also share testimonies of how God has been with you through those situations, which is a, a, a great thing. Jesus here is talking about um, the temple. The disciples had marveled at the temple, said, what a wonderful building it is, look at the size of those stones. Um, they very much had that kind of uh, 
this is a solid building that will never change. Um, Solid building that's never going to change its uh, status, it's never going to go, it's never going to fall down because it's so uh, incredibly solid. And uh, Jesus took them up onto the Mount of Olives where they could look, gaze upon the, the, um, the city of Jerusalem and the, the temple in all its glory. And he said, It's all going to be destroyed. And they questioned, Well, when? What is the sign that these things are going to happen? And he's been telling them about it. And, uh, and it's difficult because some of it seems to be talking about what happened in AD 70, is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army, uh, which was a horrific exile, uh, 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 not exile, uh, uh, invasion. Invasion, yeah, where, where, you, where you trap people in the city. Um, siege. siege. It was a horrific siege um, followed by uh, a final attack which there was uh, horrendous accounts of what, what happened. And the disciples are being warned about this ahead of time, and they say, what's the sign that's going to happen? And Jesus is telling them some of it, but also it's blurry into signs that seem to be talking about the end of the age, the sun darkening, the stars falling from the sky, the sun, cow, the sun of man coming with clouds of glory. Um, different uh, commentaries tell different interpretations of these things. But the, uh, the message is the same. Be ready for something terrible is coming. And now, and now he's talking about a fig tree. Um, in uh, chapter 13, verse 32, uh, verse 28. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. Now, you might remember there's been a fig tree mentioned a bit earlier. Just before, or just at the beginning of the whole temple section of Mark's Gospel, Jesus rode into Jerusalem uh, singing uh, on a donkey, people singing Hosanna. This is going back to chapter 11. And basically, he, after going into the temple, just briefly, he then went out and then he came back. And when he went into the temple properly, first of all, he stopped off, went to a fig tree, saw that there was no fruit, and so he cursed it for being fruitless. And then later on that day, they saw that the fig tree had withered. And the fig tree withering, that was like a, judge, a sign of the judgment upon Israel. It's a fruitless nation. This religion that's focused on the temple, the money changes, all that kind of thing, it's a fruitless religion. Jesus is cursing that fig tree as a picture of the end of the temple age. Mm. The fig tree withered. Mm. Just as the temple is coming to an end. Now, he's talking about, learn the lesson of the fig tree. He's talking about when it's, it's growing its twigs and its leaves and it's, it's summer is coming. It's like a new thing. So this fig tree image, he's talking about um, the new age, where worship is no longer focused on the temple, but focused on Jesus. And this is where the, the temple section of Mark's Gospel is coming to an end. One fig tree starts it, another fig tree is ending it. Um, the summer is near, the summer is coming. So what do we need to know uh, as we think about this warning, this impending doom, what do we need to know? <clears throat> what can't we know? And what do we need to do? Because that's what Jesus is doing, as he sums everything up. He's saying the temple is coming to an end, the age of following Jesus is, is taken over. This is, this is where you're at now. What do we need to know, <clears throat> first of all? Verses 28 to 31 um, tells us what we need to know. Uh, now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right 
at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass mm. away. So we're here, we've got this different fig tree that's pointing towards a new thing, towards the beginning of summer. That means that the first fig tree was about the end of the temple, the second fig tree is about the beginning of Jesus as our focus of our worship. He is the one who we come to, not to a building. And he said, when you see these things, when these various things that Jesus has described are happening, that's that's the changing. That's when the final death blow is coming to the temple. Or is he saying when you see these things, it's the end of the world? Because he's been, it just seems that it's been blurring as he's been going along talking about these things. It's been blurring. Whether he's talking about Jerusalem being destroyed or the second coming, ushering in the end of the world. Perhaps he's talking about both. The judgment on Jerusalem in AD 70 was like a pre-shadow of the judgment to come. This passage could easily be applied to either event. When we look at verse 30, Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. That just seems like he's probably talking about the temple in Jerusalem falling. There were people from Jesus' day still alive when it happened. Some of the disciples would have still been alive at that point. But, then in verse 37, um, just leaping ahead, he says, um, What I say to you, I say to everyone. What I say to you, disciples, I say to everyone. Which seems to suggest that Jesus is thinking about both events. Some of the disciples will still be around when the destruction of Jerusalem finally comes. But these warnings are also relevant to everyone. Because everybody will face final judgment. Whether you've got anything to do with Jerusalem in AD 70 or not. What we need to know is that it is coming. The warning is clear enough throughout chapter 13. Something cataclysmic is coming. And as they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, Jesus explaining to them that the temple will be destroyed, and then expanding it, talking about the sun darkening, the stars falling, the angels gathering the elect from the four corners of the earth, everything we think of as solid, all that ground that's so reliable and permanent, he's telling us it's going to be gone in an instant. Everything you think of as certain will be whipped away. But there's one thing that we can trust completely. One thing that will never be undermined. The words of Jesus. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The very ground beneath our feet will disappear but Jesus' words will still be true. So we need to trust Jesus. No matter what happens. No matter how much our expectations of life go sideways. Up, down, backwards. Jesus is the, the core that we can hang on to and know that he will always be the same. Always there. And he will carry through and carry us through beyond even death into eternal life. The disciples, they wanted to know the sign that these things would happen. What is the sign that this is going to happen, the temple is going to be destroyed? What's the warning sign? We, we, we got a bit of a, a taste of a warning siren last week, didn't we, at three o'clock? Mm. It was, uh, it was the government sent it to tell us that the um, Bible study on the Trinity should finish, and we ignored it and carried on. But it was exciting. My mobile phone made a noise I'd never heard it make before. Um, 
But the early warning system is supposed to tell us about floods and earthquakes, which we often get here, don't we, in uh, Winslow? But um, what were the disciples to look out without mobile phones to tell them that there's something bad coming? Well, Jesus is very vague. He's talking about this fig tree. He's saying that there's going to be, well, look, look, there'll be people coming who are going to claim to be the Messiah. There's going to be these wars and things. There's, there's, the end is near when these things happen. And you think, well, we kind of wanted something a bit more specific so we could know when is the right time to pack our bags. We want to get out of Jerusalem before the siege starts. So just a very clear crystal now. Somebody blowing a trumpet saying, evacuate! Mm -hmm. Why can't we get a clearer warning? Well, because of what we cannot know. What we need to know is that the end is coming. What we need to know is that Jesus' words are what we really need. They are the reliable thing in our lives. But what we cannot know. About that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun, but only the Father. No one knows about the day or the hour. Not the angels, not even the sun. I mean, this is, this is just a fascinating verse from a, a you think of Trinitarian, the, the theology of the Trinity. This is, a, this is a piece of information that we know for sure Jesus doesn't know something. But the Father does. Make of that what you will uh, in your Trinitarian theology. Um, no one knows the time of this climactic moment except for the Father. So, uh, are we talking about Jerusalem or are we talking about the end of the world or both? Well, yeah, good question. Let's say both. Because that seems to be the realm that we're in, in these closing verses, is talking about the both seems to, it does seem to be emerging in my mind, looking at the language of it. Um, basically, we cannot know when the second coming will happen. We know about the fall of Jerusalem because of hindsight. They call it the benefit of hindsight, but how does that benefit anybody? Um, it's already happened. So, we cannot know about the second coming. But watching and waiting, that is all any of us can do. Knowing, for sure, that, that is something we cannot do. Uh, if Jesus doesn't know when it will happen, well then, no. why waste your time in trying to dig deep, in trying to explore the clues in trying to be Sherlock Holmes of the Bible and figuring out, oh, that's the day. So look, don't believe anybody who confidently tells you that the end of the world is going to take place on this time. There, there is a, a whole section of the Christian publishing industry dedicated to answering this question that we've been told clearly cannot be answered. Yeah. And there are plenty of Christians out there who are convinced they can see the signs and the prophecies and that no, the, the things that nobody else before has noticed um, and that they're fulfilled, fulfilled in some no, newsworthy event and now they're convinced that Jesus is coming back next Thursday week or something. But that's not how we are supposed to live our lives. When we want to answer the unanswerable questions, it's because we don't like feeling out of control. Don't we want to know how long it's all going to take? Surely, if you're waiting for an operation and they say, well, it could take anything between three months and 12 months, you think, oh, surely you can give me a better sort of estimation than that. How long do I have to wait for? Because if we have a figure, if we have a date, it just makes it so much easier. Because we feel out of control. Uncertainty is painful. 
And so that's what I think drives a lot of the, the over excitement and over interest in end times theology, which is a really theology, it's just trying to um, figure out things like dates. We shouldn't live with a focus on the end date. How should we live? Well, what we should do is the point of the third thing. Uh, we know what we can't know, and so we shouldn't focus on it. But then what do we need to do? How should we live, to be more clear? What kind of lives should we be living? In light of what we do know and what we can't know. We know the end is coming. We know that Jesus can be trusted, but we don't know when it's going to happen. And that's painful and that's hard. And we want to do what God, we want to take the control that God has, had, has but we can't. Verse 33. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. <coughs> if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So, in modern life, we've got burglar alarms that are, are difficult to switch off. If ever you've got up in the middle of the night and uh, accidentally triggered it and you're half asleep and you've got to remember that code, you know it can be difficult to switch off. But if you actually, turns out, if you try to cut the power to a burglar alarm, it don't work. that's not a good idea. <laughs> Because they've got some backup power, magic thing going on that means it's suddenly you'll trigger it off and you know, your burglar can't come along and find the main power cable and that's going to trigger the, the alarm. So it's really difficult to get past the burglar alarm unless the person in charge forgets to set it. In other words, the weak link is the human factor. Well, in those days the human factor counted for a lot more you didn't have burglar alarms, you had a person that would sit in front of the door if you were rich enough to uh, employ servants and, uh, or have slaves, you would uh, probably be rich enough that your house was a target for burglars. So you'd employ one of your servant slaves to sit in front of the door or sit at the door guarding the house. The disciples, they needed to be alert because they might get caught out by these events. The sign might not be obvious at the time. So Jesus pushes home this message with this parable. And you've got the story of this homeowner. And you can imagine the servants, they've, got, they've all gone off and they've, um, the, the homeowner's gone off and they're all sort of talking to each other. When do you think he's going to come back? Go back to verse 735. Please bear this um, Therefore, keep watch because, you know, when's he going to come back? Is it going to be evening? Or is it going to be midnight? Or when the rooster crows? Or at dawn? And you can imagine all these servants maybe spending all their time talking about at which point is he going to come back? And some of them have got some really good arguments, theories as to when the owner is going to come back. And they're basing all their actions based on that. But he says, no. If he comes suddenly, if he comes suddenly, that, that, the owner could come back at any time. Your theories about when he comes back might be completely wrong. And if he comes back and finds that you spent your whole time arguing and 
obsessing about when he's coming back, well then you've not been doing what you should be doing. And um, particularly if your job is to guard the house, the doorkeeper, he has this particular role. And if there's some, one thing that he needs to do above everything else is stay awake. If he falls asleep, someone might burgle the house. If the owner has enemies, someone might attack. And if the doorkeeper is asleep, there will be no warning. Look, you have one job. Stay awake at that door. So the warning to the disciples is stay awake. As they face the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem, don't be caught off guard by the Roman army when they attack. You really don't want to be trapped inside that city because it would be, it would be a kind of hell on earth. If you remember from when we were looking at it a few weeks ago. Horrific scenes, descriptions. A siege that led to desire, disease, starvation, cannibalism, and then it culminated in this blood-soaked final attack. That would be the end of the temple. The end of this age, in which the, the legitimate, it would be the end of the age in which the legitimate worship of God was focused on the temple. But by the time this destruction came, that's, that, that focus has shifted completely to Jesus. And this is what people probably have missed. They're all focused still on the temple. The temple is no longer a place for what? It's just an empty shell. No, Jesus. This is where you should be focusing now. And so this is the attitude that Christians should have as they live their lives. Living with an awareness that the end will come. The judgment of Jerusalem was just a foretaste. But what's coming is going to be even worse. The reason we talk about hell on earth because hell is so awful. If there's one thing that we should do everything we can to avoid, it is go to hell. Whatever it takes, stay away from that place. Be ready so that we don't end up there. One day, each one of us will face the end, whether we're still around for the return of Christ or not. We will all one day die. And yet, how many of us live as if this temporary body of ours is an eternal home? Mm. You know, we might disagree with somebody who's an atheist about what happens when you die. Um, the Bible teaches us that it's appointed to everyone to die once and then to face judgment, whereas atheists will say, when you're dead, you're dead. When you're buried, you're gone. Yeah, that's the end of you. You don't exist anymore. Um, obviously, we can debate that. But the one thing that we can agree on is that we die. Mm, yeah. Each and every one of us will die. And yet, the majority of people insist on living their lives as if, as if death is something that happens to other people. In my experience, it has always happened to somebody else. And the, the, the real shocking thing is that as Christians, I think we live like this as well very often. We believe in the afterlife, but at a theoretical level. We find ourselves very attached to our homes on earth, and our lives on earth, and the reputations on earth. And when we get the chance to share the gospel, we might find ourselves talking about how Jesus can be our friend and helper in life. It's like that we've forgotten that the essence of evangelism is warning people about hell. Warning people that the end is coming. When we're faced with a situation when someone will die, that can really focus the mind. Uh, so encouraged by Mike's testimony a few weeks ago talking about the conversation he was able to have with his mum a few days before she passed into eternity. At that point, there is no more important conversation than are you ready to come to God, to meet God? We're Christians, and so it's our job to warn people 
that one day they will face the judgment. Mm-hmm. Even if you're an atheist, you don't believe in the judgment, but you know you're going to die, but do you really believe it? Surely if you're an atheist, you should at least give some credence to the possibility that you may be mistaken. Isn't it worth giving some thought to the possibility that you might need to prepare for that day? There is a judgment, and if you don't believe that, then you might be wrong. Make sure that you are ready for that day. Every single one of us. Because however young and healthy we are, we don't know what ground, what hole is going to suddenly open beneath our feet. Take the certainty out away from underneath us, just like that. And all of a sudden, we stood before the living God, having to give an answer for our lives. As Christians, are we aware of just how urgent our mission is? Or are we complacent? Are we just drifting along? Are we basically asleep? ground beneath our feet is uncertain, whether we recognise it or not. But what we know for sure is our lives will end, and what we can trust in the words of Jesus. Yeah. So we all need to stay awake. Mm-hmm. And I think quite a lot of us need to wake up. Mm. Wake up! What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch Father of God in heaven, we do thank you that you have not abandoned us. You sent your Son to warn us and to give us an escape from the horrific judgment that everybody will face and will... The the only way of avoiding it is through your Son. And so, Lord, wake us up, we pray, to this reality, this harsh reality, where we have become complacent, Lord, where we have fallen asleep. Wake us up, we pray. May we be good servants, attentive watchmen, good guards, people who are alert to the realities of eternal life. And may you give us opportunities to share that, to warn others. And Lord, will you save people? There are so many people who are oblivious to their danger. Lord, will you wake them up? Use us to be the siren call. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Let's stand and sing for you ourselves.